Welcome to the CQN Podcast, a Celtic state of mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and this week I'm joined by Lisbon Lion, John Fallon. John joined Celtic 60 years ago and he was an integral part of the squad that went on to conquer Europe. I invited the original Holy Goalie to a Celtic State of Mind's first live event which took place at the penalty spot on Sword Street in Glasgow and as always, Big John's input did not disappoint. We chatted about pay disputes, bonus rows, cigarettes and alcohol at Sea Mill, breaking up the Lisbon Lions and the Quality Street Gang, the Battle of Montevideo, his volatile relationship with Jockstein, and John finally tells the full story behind his European Cup winner's medal. This interview was done in front of a live audience, so there is some background noise and mobile interference. Hopefully, this does not stop you from enjoying the show. Here is John Fallon with a Celtic state of mind. One of the big things I remember that came to light when I was doing the quality street gang, John, was Celtic was some players. fiddling then. Uh, well, some the, fiddling then. The wages back then, although the, the, your normal weekly wage was not great, it was always made up with the bonus payments. Oh, that's all the wages you got. But then, obviously, when David Hay got injured, and it, eventually um, him and Conley went on strike because... Uh, the fact is they weren't getting their bonuses ah. so how, how did I mean when you when you look back at Jock Steen and this man who people feared him certain people feared him and, and you've got a young upstart like David Hay going on strike I mean how was that received amongst the, the senior pros like yourself oh we run the very, way back 65 the first time we'd won the cup for 11 years mm-hmm. and uh, the bonus came in your wages on the Tuesday. And we said, eh, is that what we're getting? So there was a wee confab in the snooker room. Mm-hmm. Right, Billy, that's what's happening. Do it. So Murdoch went with him. They walked in and the next thing, you had this racket. The door's <laughs> getting slammed. And we're sitting. And the door gets slammed. And everybody looked. And they called us for everything. Shower of greedy so and so as you's. We said, wait a minute, boss. We got made bigger weight a bonus for beating Kilmarnock in the quarterfinals than what we go for the cup. And he turned around and says, You weren't expected to beat Kilmarnock because Kilmarnock was a top team then. So we beat Kilmarnock and we played. What was that? We couldn't argue with him. Just greed, that's all you're, you're not happy with your wages. You're all sitting, 18 pounds a week or something. <laughs> No. And then he brought another man out, I remember the, a bonus. Score in some amount of goals, you get maybe a pound or something extra. So that time we were rattling the goals in. It was cost them too much. That went out the window, nah, you're not getting it. <laughs> so if you lose goals, so you'd imagine if it was 6 4, you're only getting two pounds. And we said, oh, well, man, if I scored six goals, it was supposed to be, ah, but you lost. <laughs> oh, you lost that, you lost. So that went, that went out the window. So, I don't think they ever settled the bonus system. Was it difficult for Big Billy? Because he was kind of like the spokesperson for the squad. Well, that was his duty. Yeah. You know, and it was it was a bit awkward going into his pal. And then, boss, uh, I don't know if he went in and says, hey, boss, I don't think there, you know, a wee problem here. Because I remember, uh, what do you call it, Alec Bowden telling us about a tour of America. And they were sailing over in the Queen of Queen Mary. And they got to the big hotel in New York. And they're all sitting and they talking about expenses. A daily expense. How much are we getting to spend it? You know, five dollars or something. It's good money probably then. And a couple of the players said, I don't think that's a, a much. And Tully says, I agree with you boys. I agree with you. I'll have a meeting with Bob. The other day I was calling Mr. Kelly, Chad, as he said, Bob. So I went up the stairs and there's a sort of balcony and it was an echo. And Chad went up and he says to him, Hey Bob, some of these players are not happy with this daily exercise. I'm quite happy. I can tell you right now, I'm happy, but they're no. And Kelly says, That's okay, Charlie. I'll deal with it. I will okay then, Bob, when I went away. He came down and he says, I sorted him there, didn't I? And I said, you're a 
and the liar. He said, we could hear you. There was an echo coming. <laughs> and Kelly could hear them doing the stairs talking about the bonus. <laughs> so, I don't know, that, but Charlie, you know, that was the, the position you were in. Mm -hmm. You were free to talk about money. You did you speak about money at Parkhead? It, it kind of reared its ugly head again, didn't it, in the 1970 European Cup run where... Oh, that was before that too, Lisbon. Ah, well, you'd seen... Because <clears throat> the bonus was split between five years. Mm -hmm. The winning bonus was split, but nobody knows. But, you know, the team that won it got their full bonus and we got a share. Right. But uh, going to Lisbon, my recollection was stemming from Lisbon, we decided to have a player pool. And Jim would tell you, the players always had a pool and said, right, that's what we're wanting. Mm -hmm. Right, fair enough. So if you'd done an article in the paper and we're getting paid for it, we went into the pool and we went into it. So, right, that's okay, we'll do that. Adidas agreed to be Adidas, Umbro, everything was okay. So we decided to have a meeting and said, wait a minute, Joe wants to be in our meeting. Hi. Uh, where's his money going to? for the Daily Mirror, or the Sunday Mirror. What's his feet? Is his feet going in there? The pool? Oh, I never thought of that. He says, well, if he's one part of the pool, he's got to be... Yeah. So he went in with Thigbid. All hell broke loose again. You know, it would, I would say that never affected the final, it was just a... We got beaten, that was it. Mm -hmm. But the papers try to make a issue of it. I know who he is. A, a person a person I just could not stand. Because my eruptions with me than anything else. A yellow camera and I just hate it. didn't like the man at all. And he put a spin on it. When yep. it was, uh, and, bonus it. And, and the funny thing was, uh, me Bailey, Roger Bailey, was the ghostwriter for it. And he was part of the media mm -hmm. squad. Mm -hmm. So they just stuck it up. Just to say that it was part of the, the deal, you know. Yeah, yeah. So when you've got the, uh, the Lisbon Lions squad who were all particularly loyal to Celtic when you look at oh, how long mm -hmm. they played um, and none of them got a big a big money transfer down south or any of that no just opened the door and said there yeah, cheerio there you, there you go and then you've got this group of youngsters coming in your mm -hmm. Leash and McCarry Hay Conley etc and they guys start going on strike for more money what what was the thoughts in well the they'd, they'd they'd been taught hadn't they they knew with the awful is you know what's going on because that that was a, don't forget, when they boys came in with their pool, about 20 odd players. Mm -hmm. So they were part of it as an early age, so they knew what was happening. And they'd hear us all moaning and groaning and saying, oh, wait a minute, that's not working. And, and that's when it finished up. Well, you don't talk about wages, you know. Mm -hmm. There was the story going about that Davey left. He was at Royal getting appointed captain, and he turned around and says, Big job. He says, I think I should get £5 above everybody else. Like, Billy. Big Jock says, no, you don't. You don't get that. You're not on. David says, bit, Billy, don't talk to us about money. So David went to Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And when Kenny was made captain, there, Kenny, a wee bit extra for being a, a captain. So that all came out now. And the other boys were saying, oh, aye, here we go. Mm -hmm. He broke up one team too quick. Mm -hmm. And he broke up the next team too quick. Because they have all got a wee bit nippy at him. You know, well, your expectations would have risen mm -hmm. with the success. Mm -hmm. So he, he didn't like mm -hmm. anybody challenging him. And it's a surprise for a man that was what in the coal fields and a union man. Because mm -hmm. when Wally Wallace came, Wally was the uh, union man for Harps. Right. So he came to Celtic. And I remember somebody saying, Oh, I, I mean, a union man here. Wally's a, the man to see. <laughs> so they'd be meeting. Again, the door gets kicked off. What the... Unions? What do you want a union for? So they said, but you had a union when you worked in the pitch. That's a different matter. <laughs> so you had no union, you had no backing. You know, Rangers had joined the union, so we were the only team outside the union, so you had no backing. You know, no backing for injuries, but which was Scottish, Scottish Union, Players Union was a joke compared with the English Union. I was surprised when Wally and Neil, God rest Wally, I had a knee operation there, John, and this was done, and that was done. I says, National Health? He says, no. I says, how would it? He says, English Union, Players Union. 
I said, well, you were only doing there about a year and about. This is, I know. He says, but you look after me. Mm-hmm. I went, crying out loud, you're joking. And that, and that, well, he'd left long, long before that. But this is what we missed out on. Mm-hmm. A back and somebody back you up. And you think, you know, when you look at the stadium, for example, it was a dilapidated state and the training facilities and even the training kit and all the rest of your time and time again, European Cup final, semi final, quarter finals, mm-hmm. yet in the background we were kind of run amateurishly. Would you agree with that? Oh, well, it was a laugh. You walk to Barrafield every day, you know, and then if it was too wet, you'd allowed to take a car along. Then we discovered you couldn't take people in the car because the insurance you weren't covered for ex- for players being in the car. You to have a, a separate insurance for liability. So that was it. So you just walked back and forth then. And that's how it was worked. You know, the big heavy jerseys for goalkeepers. And you used to put them into a drying room. Well, it wasn't a drying room. It was where the, tea, uh, the boiler room was for the heating and the floodlighting. It was an office and it was warm, so you just threw your jersey in there. And the next day, you, you could crunch it. <laughs> it was the stuck. My back, the, the training again. Banky, your socks were oh, washed maybe once a week or something. <laughs> anyway, you know, the training was. But you go abroad and then you. I think we noticed that who was the first team we went to? We went to Valencia and we went to their stadium, and next door was a. What's that? Well, that's where we train. A compound in a, another field, and you're saying, mm-hmm. Oh, aye, and we come back to Barrafield. And don't, no, not at that time because we trained at Celtic Park, and if, we used to use a uh, Mount Vernon Greyhound track, right? We used to train up there as well. And we used to train away down the back of Westfield, or Westhorn, way down the back, in the, where the Bone Greens were at Celtic Park by Barrafield. I remember getting told the story that I asked for. Refused to train at Barrafield, is that right? <laughs> Wouldn't it surprise you? came over and refused to train. <laughs> there was no grass on it. You know, the big beard part was like the public part, muck. You know, I, right, put, a, I put a muck. John, the um, very interesting story, but you and I have discussed it before about your medal, the mm-hmm. European Cup winner's medal, um, and how there was a bit of uh, hoodwinkery going mm-hmm. on with regards to who got what. What was the story behind the medals and, and the presentation of them? That... We, after one the cup, we went to the hotel, checked and everything was okay, so we went to this restaurant and my landlord late in coming. I think they'd taken the cream puff because it got beat. It took a long time, so we just wanted the meal over with. We were told to be there, so they came. We weren't too happy, they weren't talking to end day. And Billy was asked, called up with the president of the chairman he was handed this brown box at some medals. So he looked, he said, right, OK. So he started with Ronnie and just handing everybody a medal. So he came, there was one left, and he went, that's yours. So that was a 12. Mm-hmm. It was straight. So that was it. And I remember putting it on the table, putting it in my top pocket, the blazer. I was sitting talking away, time passed, and Big Jock came up. Where's your medal? He said, it's in my pocket. Give me a... I said, what for? Oh, they forgot one for the referee. So I went, OK. I gave him that. And that was it. Uh, I got a replacement in uh, Christmas dance in Glasgow. And then I just looked at it and said, that's the same medal. And on the back, a banqua. Oh, that's, that's the same. So I never thought about it. And it wasn't until somebody said to me, that's a that's not a real medal you've got. I said, sorry, do you know? Didn't have a stamp on it. Mm-hmm. And it's a different colour. Because it's more of a golden one. The European was a red, gold, you know, there's a red cup. And uh, when I looked at my medal, it was shiny. I went, ah, hell. And that's there is it. a particular uh, hallmark at the rear of it. Aye, and uh, <coughs> right, because it was made in Switzerland, mm-hmm. and this one was made in Birmingham. Right. And who else got one of them? The other squad players who had I, I have no idea. Them, you know? I don't know. I, I presume that's what they got as well. And uh, it was a certain director who looked after a lot of the players. Molly Hawkey turned around and told me the real story. Went to Bob Kelly. Right. I never went to the ref. No, I never went to the ref. I just said, well, that's it, you know. So that's how... Strange way to operate. Eh? Huh. We were talking to Jim Craig the other week there, and Jim's just released a book, which was like his diary. Jim, obviously, on these tours and on these trips, 
was spending a lot of time taking notes and, and keeping a diary. I think it was um, my the library in Glasgow, the Mitchell Library, too. Oh, right. <laughs> right. What did you get up to? Was your roommate Ronnie? Yep. And uh, I mean, did you have time to keep Nobody a diary, take John? Or no, it's just all up there. <laughs> so, what, what did you get up to on your away days? Nobody would come into your room, even at a uh, sea mill, because uh, we were the smokers. <laughs> and, I that used to just sit smoking and as soon as you opened the door I'm like, ah jeez ah, and they split them and uh, they changed their room at sea mill the old sea mill used to walk in as a revolving door there was a number one room was there that was big jokes and then all of a sudden it got changed goalkeepers in there so we went in ah, ok and uh, you'd have a wee puff and that you had the bay window. So we used to open the bay window. I don't know if you'd say I'm a bit. Sometimes you used to get that. So what the, f- the window. Open the window. So you'd open the window. Somebody'd sneak in. Come and sneak in and sit in. And all of a sudden, you'd hear a big joke. Better check up. Who's in and who's out? And he'd come in that third room and oh, look at the smell and he'll have smoking used to it in here. And of course whoever's sitting. We used to in here with a smoke. Ah, can no bars just sitting talking. <laughs> Give him for a five pack. <laughs> <laughs> then there was another one they, they put a bar in, Seamal Hydro. Well, they wouldn't be known to have a bar. And <laughs> I went one day to get something out of the drawer and I opened the drawer and I went, Who would have put these pints of lager in here? <laughs> after training and I went to the bar I said hey George who put that he went shh went hi ok so somebody had said to him hey, just put them in the goalie's room because they'll not go in there because of the smell of smoke perfect lining pints in the door in the drawer the drawer was heavy enough it was an old fashioned heavy you know Victorian wardrobe and he pulled the, the drawer bottom was even worse no wonder the heaviness eh? that was supposed to be your training game you did training it was basically like it was in it I went oh my god well how do you do young Willie McBride do you mind if I sit here down by your graveside and rest for a while Need the warm summer sun I've been walking all day And I'm nearly done I see by your gravestone You are only 19 When you joined the Great Fallen In 1916 I hope you died well And I hope you died clean our young Willie McBride Was it slow and obscene Did he beat the drum slowly Did he play the fife slowly Did they sound the death march As they lowered you down And did the band play the last post and chorus Did the pipes play the flowers of the fall Did you leave it a wife or a sweetheart behind? In some faithful heart is your memory enshrined. Although you died back in 1916, in that faithful heart are you forever 19? Or are you a stranger without even a name Enclosed and forever behind the glass frame In an old photograph torn, battered and stained And faded to yellow in the brown leather frame Did he beat the drum slowly did he play the fine slowly did I sound the death march as they lowered you down 
Did the band play the last post and chorus? And did the pipes play the flowers of the forest? The sun, now it shines on the green fields of France. There's a warm summer breeze, it makes the red poppies dance. And look how the sun shines from under the clouds. There's no gas, no barbed wire, there's no gun firing now. But here in this graveyard, it's still no man's land. The countless white crosses stand mute in the sand. To man's blind indifference to his fellow man. To a whole generation that were butchered and damned. Did he beat the drums slowly? Did he play the five slowly? Did they sound the death march as they lowered you down? And did the band play the last post and chorus? Did the pipes play the flowers of the fall? I am Willie, my bride, I can't help wonder why To those that lie here, no why did they die And did they believe when they answered the call Did they really believe that this war would end war Well the sorrow, the suffering, the glory the pain, the killing and dying were all done in vain. For young Willie McBride, it all happened again, and again and again and again and again. Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they play the fine slowly? Did they sound the death march? As they lowered you down Did the band play the last post and chorus Did the pipes play the flowers of the forest Did they beat the drums slowly Did they play the fife slowly Did they sound the death march As they lowered you down did the band play the last post in chorus? And did the pipes play the flowers of the fall? You played in, your only goalkeeper that's played in two World Club Championship matches, mm-hmm. only Scottish goalkeeper that's played in two World Club Championship matches. You replaced Ronnie Simpson under complete and utter farcical circumstances in the setting leg. What was your thoughts when you entered that park or when you saw Ronnie I get just hit? knew nothing about it, just on and that was it. Well, the only thing I, I know is Bobby Lennox grabbing me, pulling the tracksuit. I said, what are you doing? He says, you're playing. I said, I'm playing. What are you talking about? Now? Next thing, I think it was Stephen pulling my throat off. Bobby's pulling it. And we walked out in the park and Ron's going by and I said, what's going on? And the referee was ready to start the game without a goalie. <laughs> we never even seen anything that happened. Nobody seen what happened. And that was it. I just went, I said, oh, right, okay then. So you weren't in anywhere near the incident? You weren't in the, the park? No. Nobody knows what happened. It's a mystery, total mystery. So the teams were out? They were ready to kick off. Ready to kick off. In, in fact, uh, what happened was... We never got a ball to practice, you know, for a game you always got a ball. So I was away looking for, up this big long tunnel looking for a ball and the wouldn't give me a ball. And I'm shouting and I came back up, no ball. Eh, what we're learning to scrap this is no time. Come on, you're playing. That's it. The tracks it was off and they put one in the park. That's it. Baptism of fire. You just got you've got to get one, mate, then that's it. You've you've got to think about me, forget what happened. 
We also played in the, the third leg, the infamous third leg, because mm-hmm. we yeah, you got man in the match. Did I? In, in, the, in the third <laughs> leg, aye. Um, I got the blame for the goal. Goalies get the blame for everything. That, 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 they're a bigger fight in the dressing room after the game than what was on in the park. What was that about then? I got the blame of the goal. And it was on, I just had to look at something that was on the other day. And it's something about the, the gents of Racing Club. Aye. And it shows you the goal. And I've got a photo in the house, and it's signed with their, their players in the goal. And Mick Jock says to me, You should have got that. And boy, my mother just went berserk again. Well, I said, You you blaming him all the time? I says, Aye, he doesn't like goalkeepers. And that was that. But he did promise me that I'd play the following week. He says, Oh, you've done your. But I shouldn't have taken t- t- his word because he was famous for that. And we went to Edry and the boots is out and for some reason the team was read out and I wasn't in the team. I looked down, my boots was away and I know that Bob Kelly said to him, what are you playing at? And I just walked out. I was saying nothing. Sean just said, don't say a word. I said, no, I better not. That was me and it it was bad, bad enough but that's you know I think if, I don't know if you can share it I think you said something that, again it was Ali Cameron and he said this is Ronnie Simpson's birthday and I think they put a bandage round around his head played him and I said well if he was fit to play there he should have played on Wednesday I decide I said okay I just tell him what I thought of him under my breath as well <laughs> that was it you know it happened a few times before. before. Oh. Happened in '68, the famous game, the two weeks game. Uh, that was when the fixtures was changed. Mm-hmm. Supposed to play Clyde. We did play Clyde at Shawfield, the first. And the way the structure was made, we were all told the team I was playing at Shawfield, and the boots was all laid out. And I went in, and you still knew the boots was out, so you never went till the team was read out and uh, we were all in the dressing room and the team was read out and I looked I seen my boots getting lifted and they played Ronnie and Ronnie got an injury some kind of, I don't know where he go and uh, he said ah it's alright he's just he's just at it he's kidding on and, he's, and I went in the next day they boots looked he always walked into the dressing room you could tell the team between looking at the boots we are all sitting in the snooker room Everything's quiet, and the next thing the door gets a little battered. And he just walked in and he pointed straight at me. You, come here. And I said, well, I've got five, eh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes before the kickoff. I dragged into the dressing room. You're playing. I said, I'm what? Oh, he said he's no fat. So by the time I got stripped, the referee was in checking the boots that was in the park. And it happened the following year again. I but it's when Paul hit Big Billy in the chest. Remember they gave a penalty kick. I went, oh wait a minute, is there a jinx with me? And uh, even after Madrid, he turned around and says, I think that you played yourself into the team. No. And when they play me again, I went, okay. I just accept that. No. I know that uh, there are a few clubs after me and they wouldn't let me go. So to grin and bear it. Do you think he it was loyalty? I didn't like using the word loyalty, but uh, do you think it was loyalty to Simpson, your treatment, or just? I don't know. It just is that it. You know, it's just. I remember as a boy, he actually told me to go to England. I said I'm not going to England. So I thought United wanted me doing a trial. I said I'm not going. I said I'm staying here. I said well, I want to leave here for and go away doing the Scunthorpe. I said you know what? I, I, well, I want you to go do and get some money. I said I don't want you to go do. So that, see, ever since then it was sort of. Rock and roll. <laughs> Apart from the two each game that you mentioned, that I mean, you had some notable great games for Celtic, especially in the San Siro against AC Milan as well. What do you remember about that night? That was a blizzard. That was just a farcical. Like, you know, the, I think the, the the goal lines were changed about three times in colour. You had a yellow, a red, and a blue <laughs> because the wee boy was out with a brush cleaning the eighteen yard line. And they just used a different colour round about. And the game kept playing on and playing on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and as the ball got to, the referee allowed you to take the snow off the ball. 
if he didn't, if you're lifting the ball there slowly, it was, and the referee allowed it to help, so it was just a blizzard. And then the bus, the wipers went the bus. <laughs> it's a joke, there was a wee boy assisting the driver, and he was hanging out the, the bus and he was using the, the wipers to see where we were going back to the hotel. And that was, I said, well, we'll go to Parkhead, we'll, get, we'll do them at Parkhead. Because you've achieved the hardest thing. You've achieved the hardest thing, aye. So you won in a disaster. And I got blamed for that. And I wonder, what is it with you? You know, when Big Billy made the thing, made, it was man against man, Pratty. He didn't know where Pratty was going to go, you know. Because these boys were too, they're too good for you, you know. The, and he just got me out and I said, my angles is good, my angles is good. They still screwed it round about me into the net and I went half oh, up and my left back was away down no man landing in the show what did you come out for I said well I've need to cover John Clark was left with two so John didn't know who to pick up and I came to help him the two was just with his skin he said you shouldn't have come out I said if I don't come out it's even worse so I'm going to for that <laughs>
Thank you to John Fallon for taking the time to be a guest at our event and for chatting to Kevin Graham and I. Like John's ancestors, the music you just heard came from Ireland. First up was The Furies and Davy Arthur with the beautifully haunting Greenfields of France. And following that was the legendary Christy Dignam with Aslan and This Is. As I mentioned before, the penalty spot hosted a Celtic State of Mind's first live event and they were also kind enough to give us two copies of John Fallon's autobiography, Keeping in Paradise, as prizes for the podcast. The books are signed by John and his co-author David Potter and they would make great gifts for that Celtic fan in your life. To find out what you need to do to be in with a chance of winning these prizes, just visit at the CQN podcast on Twitter. You can also keep up to date with our movements at Paul Dykes and at A Northern Pros. A Celtic State of Mind's previous episodes can be accessed by searching iTunes, Speaker or your pre-installed podcast player. Make sure to subscribe and you won't miss our upcoming episodes with Frank McGarvey and perhaps our biggest guest yet, our former Celtic player and manager. Join us again next week where we'll be back alongside another special guest with a Celtic State of Mind. Until then, keep the faith.